So, uh, Rob, uh, we have talked a couple of times in the past. It's, it has been more than 20 years since the last time, and we always talked about albums. Today, we're going to talk about books. The Metal God, now also the author. Um, a, a year and a half ago, you released your autobiography, a fantastic book. Uh, I just loved it, and thank you so much for sharing. Um you, you wrote in the book that um, uh, you had a lot of offers through the years to to write such a book, but you were always reluctant. Was there a, a certain um, a turning point for you where you changed your mind or was it more uh, a matter of letting the thought uh, mature through the years? Um, for me, it was all about definitely the timing. The, the, first, the first time I was approached, to make a book like confess i was in my 30s and i think it's very natural for people in music or anything in the creative sense when you're doing really well there's an opportunity that publishers see to kind of jump in and 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 give you the chance to do something like that but i said no i i just feel like i'm at i'm at the halfway point in my life you know mm. i've still got a lot of things i want to do and i think that because life, life is all about experience and events. You think about anybody's life and you can put a timeline of series of events, yeah, going sure. to school, you know, your first date, your first song you listen to, all these things. Um, so I just waited. I waited. And then it was just that, that one phone call I had on a certain day and we had this offer from... Um, Hachette and and they would like to take a meeting in New York and have a talk and so I did that with the boss and it just felt great because again you you have to have the comfort value of the people that you're working with are going to do the best job for you mm -hmm. because you're handing your life over to somebody else in that respect and they they um they said all the right things that I that I felt I needed to hear so that's how we we got the ball rolling as I say mm. Uh, can you uh, take us through the, the process? I mean, there must be so much work uh, behind a book like this. I mean, so many uh, trips down memory lane. Uh, there's so many stories and, and so many details. Uh, it must be hard to remember everything and what to bring, what to have in the book. I mean, it must have taken you a long time to, to gather all this. When I, when I went back to my room after I took the meeting and I'd said, yes, let's do this, I thought, oh, what have I done? What have I done? <laughs> yeah. now, now I've got to try and remember everything that's happened in my life. But then out of the blue comes this guy, Ian Gittings, who worked with me on Biblical. He's a guy I'd never met before. I knew a little bit about his work, but nothing of any, of any great substance. But Ian Gittings is this guy that, unbeknownst to me, had approached our management company decades before um, about having the opportunity of work, working with me to do whatever project. And where I'm leading to with this is that when I met Ian, the, 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 the instant uh, clicking the chemistry was that he was from the same part of the UK that I'm from, Walsall in the West Midlands. He was born and raised less than five miles away from myself. And I'm a little bit older than Ian, but that was important to me because if you can if you can sit down with somebody that speaks like you, has the same accent almost, and has walked the same streets as you and comes from a, a similar kind of circumstances and background in their lives, then that just warms the the important again chemistry that you need to sit down and really confess as we did sure. yeah <laughs> so so then then you think well are we going to do this like today we'll talk about 1950s the 50s and then tomorrow we'll talk about 1960s and Ian said no we won't do that he said I'll have my I'll have all my questions we're going to go all over the place which to me sounded like chaos <laughs> because I'm a very methodical person mm. in the process of create creativity. But Ian was just the master of 
taking me on this journey through my life. He was able to make things that happened to me in 1990 connect to something that happened to me when I was seven or eight years old at school. It was remarkable, absolutely remarkable. And the great thing about that is that you don't feel like it's a chore. We spoke together for like 50 hours or more over the periods of, of getting together. And and he just went by in a flash. And I really look forward to him coming to my house every day and sitting in the kitchen with me, have a cup of tea and a biscuit and just talk and talk and talk. Well, I did the talking, but he would, he was so eloquent in the questions. So the process was was for me it was easy because I love people. I love to talk. I love to engage and talk about anything and everything in the world and life. Um, so he he just made the whole um, experience really enjoyable. Even the tough parts we were able to get through them. Um, so sitting with someone that's going to do that job, I think it's very very it's crucial that you that you have that connection. Sure. Hmm. That this isn't some guy that's like a ghostwriter that's going to sit there and, you know, pretend to be you. He was able to really make it work and, and make it real and make it honest and make it pure. Hmm. I was really surprised that uh, not long ago, there was another book, Biblical, which is a newest one. Uh, it turned out to be a kind of a, a supplement to, to confess, but also sort of an... an IBC um, being uh, um, a front man in the the biggest heavy metal band in the world, or, or one of them, um, it's a different approach. Um, when did you decide that you wanted to uh, write another book? Did you know that in the first place, and that this biblical book would be sort of different? Um. It's like when you write a song, when you're writing a song, as as the song is being created, and then when you're in when you're in the completing area of the song, once the song is written, then it has to be mixed and mastered and blah 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 blah. But when you're hearing that song, it, it makes you think of other opportunities. Hmm. You hear a riff, you hear you hear you you hear a melody, and that kind of gives you a thought for something else. And that's how it was with with uh, with biblical. As we were in the last few days of, of sitting down and talking i said to ian i said oh, this is just nuts i said but I've, I've, i've already got this kind of little grain of an idea for something else and you, and i don't know what it is yet but it's come out of this confession okay he said that ian said that, that's not that's not unusual when when people make their, their autobiography that they feel that they have more things to say, but not in the context of what an autobiography is. Right. Mm -hmm. So we went away and we, we didn't see each other for, for weeks and months. But then as as we went through the, the sequence of promoting Confess, I just thought, you know, there's there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of my life that was in con, in Confess that, that we could really extrapolate on. Like crazy stuff like How do you get the, the right agent? How do you get the right manager? You know, and I didn't even think that this was going to be of. Was this was this idea going to be even valuable? Was it even going to be important, or or or, or, ha or have any connectivity to to readers? I we spoke spoke to the the, the guys at Hachette, the book people, and they went, "Let's do it. We we know what you what you're aiming for." So with that, I, we got back in touch with with Ian, and then. Just because, fortunately, the calendars worked, we were able to dive in and um, and put biblical together. Hmm. Well, you, you did this brilliantly. I mean, uh, we got all the uh, insights uh, in your life, and and we get to know so much about uh, being in a, a big band like Judas Priest, and also stuff you you never. Uh, dare to ask uh, an, an artist about so uh, i think it's uh, just brilliant and of course all these uh great and, and funny stories as well um when, when it comes to you have always been very good with words obviously but uh when it comes to to, to write a book it's something different uh was it hard to to um uh, figure out your way of telling your story uh what language to 
to you, so to speak. I mean, you you um, still have this uh, excellent British humor all the way through through the books. Um, did that just fall into place right away? Um, Ian Ian Gittin is just was able to take the sense of the sensibilities of 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 who I am and how I communicate and how I say it and how I think, and and put that same type of emotion emotional approach into biblical in in probably a more elevated way mm. i mean and I, I know there's a lot of fun stuff in confess but it's a pretty serious it's a pretty serious venture confess yeah uh but with this we could we could kind of lighten the tone we could we could bring some more light in the room and it wasn't as constrictive as some of the areas of, of confess were emotionally and, and I said to Ian, I said, I don't want this to be a plot. I don't want this book. Oh, God, he's going to tell us how to find a manager. I want to try and bring an element of, of brevity into all of these things um, just to make it more engaging and, and less less of a tome type of encyclopedia thing. How to find a lawyer. You know, that sounds pretty dull. But if you, if you, if you talk about it in the way that, that Ian was able to, carry that that's that side of my, my personality which is still being always upbeat and optimistic and you know ne- positive thoughts and always just you know looking for the <laughs> looking for the bright side of life <laughs> i nearly started whistling monty python but you know always looking at the bright side of life that kind of that kind of of, of um expression yep. was important to get in biblical and and just make it a read that you could pick up anywhere. You don't have to go from the first page to the last. You can open it in any chapter and find a little bit of information that you might be cared to find interesting. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, is it like you now after uh, the books uh, have been published that you all of a sudden remember stuff that you wanted to be in the books but it's too late i mean you have experienced so much through the years and uh is everything here or do you remember stuff it's a great that... question that's a great question steve sorry to speak over yeah. your voice um i th- i mean as as of now <laughs> as on january 2023 i think we've pretty much got everything covered but knowing me maybe something else will come up later on. I'm not actively searching is what I'm trying to say. Hmm. You know, I, I feel that I feel like a lot of things have been completed that have come off confess and gone into biblical because there were some things in confess. We had a lot of stuff left over because when we, when we sent the, when we sent the manuscript to the, to, to the publishers, they went, this is too long. Oh, come on, it's yeah. too long, too many words. And I'm thinking of Mozart and the King of Austria. He goes, I don't like this. And he goes, why? Says, There's too many notes, you know. So then I realized the value of editors, the editing process mm. of editing things down. Because I have a tendency to talk and talk and talk. And, you know, you, you take all this fluff and you put down the, the important bits and it's a lot shorter. So we took some of the elements that we left off of Confess and they were also inspirational in bringing in some of these areas and stories into biblical. So it it seems like everything's been completed. You know, I, I don't I don't have anything in my mind right now that could potentially be another book of sorts. I don't know. I think if I did do something else, it would be it would be out of it would be out of my realm in the biblical and confess experience but it might have something to do with connecting through other people and right. getting their mm. getting their ideas and opinions and experiences i don't know i don't mm. know let's wait and talk see. show host <laughs> maybe <laughs> why not <laughs> uh, you've sold albums through decades i mean uh, this is uh, a bit similar but uh, it's is something new do you do you feel the same vibe now releasing books uh, like you did with uh, uh selling albums in the past you know uh, checking uh, how many copies did i sell uh read the reviews and everything is it kind of a, a excitement a different excitement or since this is a this is a new experience for you 
Yeah, I think I think um, it's an interesting, very interesting subject. This is I could talk for hours about how you process and how you relate to and how you deal with other people's opinions and feelings and critique of the work that you make. Mm. It's a big topic, big topic of discussion. Um, but because I've lived with that since I made rock and roller in 1970 something, you know, I think I'm proof that you can get through all that in the area of what we're talking about and not let it become a, a big wall that you have to break through because just quickly, quickly, quickly talking about that that element of dealing with somebody who go, that's the biggest pile of shit I've read in my life, you know. Two, that's the greatest book I've ever read in my life. You know, it's all of that. It's all of that that you have to be mentally prepared to deal with. All creative people are sensitive. I don't care who you are. You can be the biggest, toughest guy on the planet, but everybody has a sensitive side of themselves. So to be able to accept critique, I love critique as long as it is um, of a positive nature. You know, like when you're writing, if I'm writing lyrics and somebody goes, those lyrics aren't very good uh, within the band. And I go, oh, okay, well, I'll start again, you know, because I'm I'm taking that information from people that I trust. Sure. Mm. And so many things in life are based on trust. You know, it's, mm. it's a very, again, precarious thing. It's all mental. It's all mental how you deal with it. So um, I would say that just by living a long life, I've been able to, to deal with those those things as they come along when you make a, a new book or a new record or a new song. Hmm. So you, you listen to your uh, bandmates. Uh, do you know if they read your books? Do you talk about that stuff? You know, that's a, that's a great question. I don't. I don't think I've ever. I don't think I've asked them. I don't think I've, I had a box of. I had a box of books sent to me uh, on the road because suddenly the crew the crew were going, this new book biblical. I go, I go, yeah. Can I get a copy? I said, do you want one? Yeah. You really want a book? You want? Yeah. We, so we had to get a, like a 50 books sent out for the crew. But I don't think anybody in the band asked for one. Oh, Andy Sneap asked for one. <laughs> Gave Andy okay. one. <laughs> I think that was well, about it. And it's, it's peculiar, isn't it? It's peculiar. I think it's because it's not a case of this yam yam thing. We call ourselves yam yams from the West Midlands. Hmm. We don't like to be boastful. We don't like to show off. That's not part of who we are as people. So okay. for me to go to to Glenn and go, hey, my new book's out. Would you like a copy? It, you don't do that. You wait till you ask. That's the polite thing to do. All right. You wait till you ask. And if you're not asked, then, then so be it. But I'm pretty sure it was only Andy Sneap that um, maybe I gave well, one to Ian because Ian is a bookworm. Ian is the greatest book reader since Lemmy. He's always got a face in, in a book. Ian Hill. So I'm, I'm sure I must have given Ian one. But, but there you go. Yeah, it's a peculiar thing, isn't it? Yeah. It's like when you make the solo <laughs> records. You don't rush, rush after the band and go. Here's a copy of my new album. You don't do that. You don't do that. I think that's probably the same for most musicians. It's just the way we are as people, you know. Hmm. Well, they obviously know uh, you have written about them, so uh, they probably uh, read yeah. the book already. Don't you think so? <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Who knows? Thank you for the. Thank you for the like. 10 cents I got per books <laughs> or whatever it, whatever it is yeah it's a funny thing life when it comes to talking about things that you feel are important and valuable but you don't want to encroach mm. on people mm. that you love in life but they are they are an important part of you you your life as a person so it's unavoidable and and yeah. I came across that so much in confess I didn't know what to say. And Ian would say, just say everything. Say everything. We'll put it all down in the manuscript. Read the manuscript. Tell me what, what you're comfortable with and what you're not comfortable with. 
and we'll address those issues as we come to them. And as it turned out, there was practically nothing that, that I came back and that I read for pr final approval that I said, I can't do that, you know. It's too hurtful or it's not, you know, it, it doesn't feel right internally to do. Hmm. So the whole, the whole, the whole atmosphere around this word confess is exactly what's in that book. It's, it's confessed. Absolutely. It's real. It's real. Um, before time is running out, uh, we have to get an update on the next uh, Priest album. I mean, uh, Firepower was just brilliant. Uh, I think it's your best album since uh, a Painkiller. Uh, it just blew me away. Uh, so um, I have uh, high expectations now for your next album. Uh, <laughs> How where are you in I. that process? <laughs> so do I. That's so cool that it's cool that you're saying that, Stig, because you know, three minutes ago I was talking about the way that you have to be able to to deal with people's interpretations of what you do. And the fact that you've made that statement about firepower and then comparing it to painkiller makes me kind of hold on to the side of this chair and think, oh God, you know, the the project has become even more huge because that's what happens. When, when you're in a band, you're always trying to better yourself. You're always mm -hmm. trying to say, this is the best album we've ever made. It's just a natural thing to do. And I'm aware of the, of the, of the great success and love that was given to Firepower. And, and so how do you deal with that? You, you, well, firstly, you have to let that go. You have to let that go because it's like, it's like you're chasing after something that's elusive. Yep. What's the point of, of trying to emulate, firstly, emulate something that you've already done? You've just got to do like we've always done with Priest, that the way that every album has its own concept, every album has its own thing. You know, British Steel isn't Painkiller. Painkiller isn't Point of Entry. Point of Entry isn't Nostradamus. So this album is shaping up to be its own thing. And uh, as I've been saying in these recent Zooms, they're all, wa they're all waiting for me because... All the the, mu the music is done. The music oh, right. is done. I've got the album. I've got the album here in front of me on my, on my laptop, and um, it sounds fucking amazing, which you expect every musician to say. But I've really got to do my work now and make sure that what I do relates to the great work that the guys have done. So it's coming together. You know, it will be ready when it's ready. Yeah. But we are trying to we're trying to stick on a timeline because. We're taking, we're hoping to do this Aussie tour. Please, Aussie, be well enough. I, I think mm -hmm. he will be. Once we do the Aussie tour, then we're going to really get into the back end of finishing the record and then probably being ready to release that. I'm, I'm saying now, I did say 23. It looks like it's 24, you know, which isn't that far away. It's already almost February in 2023. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think that, and I think that again, if you look back at all the work that we've done, Apart from that time where we were in the eighties, where we were making an album and a world tour, literally year in year out for three or four years, you can do that when you're in that mindset at that point in your life in, in the band when things are just roaring. You know, um, this far on, you you um, when you've done so much work and you you are aware of what you've achieved, then I think you naturally you take your time more. You take your time more. You know. It's, yeah. it's great. It's a really good album, and I know our fans are going to love it. Can't wait to, to hear it in 2024. <laughs> uh, will you be going to, to Glenn's studio again to, to record uh, your vocals, or will you do that somewhere in the States? Yeah, I'm doing a little... I'm doing doing a, a, most of my lyric writing here. Um, I like to I like to put... For the most part, I like to put my vocals down back in the UK. I don't know why that is. I don't know whether that's just some kind of Freudian thing. <laughs> but, um, yeah, probably back and forth from Glenn's studio to Andy's studio. Um, again, you, you, when you're creative, you have to be in the right comfort zone. You know, sure, it's got to sure. feel, you've got to feel like you're in the place to get the best out of you. And that's just like little rituals that you've done before that you know work because they worked last time. So obviously you assume they're going to work this time. Um, but yeah, it's all coming together and it's sounding, it's sounding really, 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 really good. 
Sounds promising. I was listening to the to the first Halford album uh, the other day. Uh, another brilliant album. Do you miss uh, performing um, the songs on your two Halford albums, or maybe some Fight as well? When I, when I listen to them, I miss them. Yeah, mm. I think that's just a natural feeling, you know. Sure. I, I don't know. I, I've never put I've never put that idea to 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 bed. Sort of thing, sort of thing, you know. I, I don't, I don't listen to them a lot, or if ever. <laughs> I can't remember the last time I listened to Resurrection. Sometimes something will jump up in my, on my social feeds because the AI robot is watching what you type and blah blah blah. And then they go, "Here's Crucible," you know. Here's a, here's a Crystal from this album, and here's Resurrection from this album. <laughs> And then I listen to them on, on YouTube and I go, man, that was a really good song, you know. And, I, and this, oh. this is the way Bobby, jo, Bobby Jozombek was playing drums with Scott or JJ on bass or, you know, Satchel on lead guitar. It's great because it's natural to, to yearn for those types of experiences again because they, was, they felt so good, you know. Yeah. And I get, I get, I get, I get people asking me all the time, agents, agents and promoters, you know, would you do a run with this band or that band? And I always say, well, you know, we'll wait and see because it's priest, priest, priest. I think I have to priest. That's course. that's my destiny. You yeah. Know? Yeah. But as far as as far as banging something, banging something out at some point uh, before I go to another place, um, yeah, why not? You know. If the, if the rest of the guys are up for it, I wouldn't like to do, say, the Halford band without the original members, if sure. that's at all possible. Mm. Because I think that's part of what the fans would expect. I don't want to be a tribute, is what I'm saying. I don't want to be a tribute. I want, I want to be yeah. the real. I want to be the real thing in that in that sense. Mm. Maybe someday. Maybe someday. That's a good title <laughs> for song. Maybe someday. So you've got your Pantera shirt on. Have you seen them yet? Or no, they haven't been to Europe yet. No, they're, they're coming they're here coming in uh, in June. I'll see them. Yeah. Then. Have you seen them yet? Now? Yeah, we did. Yeah. The, we did the first show together in uh, South America. Yeah, that's right. You did. It was amazing. Yeah. I uh, I was on the side of the stage most of the shows. It was just beautiful <laughs> to watch. Yeah, I'm looking it was forward such to a that. Great. Yeah, it was just such a great, beautiful thing to do for Diamond for Vinny. And, um, you know, Zach was just playing his heart out and he's getting it note for note. But he was doing, he was still Zach, you know, because he said, yeah. he said, I'm not dying bag. You know, I'm going to honor him with the leads that everybody wants to hear, but I'll be playing them the way I play the guitar. However, it was extraordinary the way the, it all meshed, you know. Mm -hmm. I was on the side of the stage and Charlie was just phenomenal, you know. Um, Rex, Phil was Phil's voice is still sensational. You know, I was hoping that they would do stuff from Cowboys, some of the early stuff, and um, to hear to hear Phil singing like he did before that he went into that incredible place was was just was just fantastic. So I know that when everybody sees them in in Europe, they're going to be blown away because it's just a it's just a fantastic. Um, experience and you're hearing those pantera songs live again yeah i saw them four times back in the days and um uh, i thought no more pantera but um uh, here they are again without the brothers of course it will never be the same but of course and it's difficult isn't it it's difficult for for the hardcore fans to 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 think that that, that this has happened but i think the hardcore fans again internally are going you know Let's give this a shot, you know, because mm -hmm. we miss the band. We miss the band so much. Admittedly, there's no way you can ever replace um, Dime and, and Vinny. But these are the right guys to do the work that they're doing, and it's just incredible to hear Walk and 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 you know the song after song after song from the from the classic Pantera here era. And um, yeah, it felt great for me because. You know, I don't know whether I told you this story, Sting, but years and years and years ago was when I first made contact with with Pantera because I was in Canada rehearsing the Painkiller tour 
and I saw Dimebag on a TV show and he was wearing a British Steel shirt and I went down right. to the studio and I met him and then I jammed with the band that night. We did a couple of Priest songs in a tiny club in and Toronto. Light, lights uh, comes out of dark. Wasn't that yeah, the track? Yeah, yeah. Well, little, that was a little. Yeah, that was a little bit later. Okay. But I was so I was so blown away. I said to the guys in Priest, I said, "We've got to take this band to Europe because they're going to be gigantic." So we took Pantera to Europe with us, and nobody knew who they were. They hadn't heard a song or a note. They went on that stage, and they just took the roof off night after night. They made Pantera conversions night after night. So by the time they got back to America, America was 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 growing at incredible speed for the love of Pantera, and and it was just it was just inc just beautiful to watch these guys because they were the uh, they were the essence of a of a new young band. Giving yeah, absolutely. It, giving that giving their lives night after night and on on stages, you know, and committed and and just so. In, intensely involved in the work and watching Dimebag play was just just the the most extraordinary feeling you could you, get. You so you to, 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 so you to see that happen, and then and then shortly later, when I'm doing some solo things and I got this idea for a song like "Comes Out of Black" and I haven't got a band, and I call Vin, call Dime, and he goes, "Can you come down to Dallas tomorrow?" And I go, "Yeah." jump on a plane and we make the, we make the song in like three hours so it's just a, cool. it's just like a continuation it's like a completion of the circle in my personal love for all of the things that have happened with pantera yeah you, you played here uh on the uh, painkiller tour with annihilator and pantera but uh you played rockefeller here in oslo um it was newly open and some idiot said it's too small for three bands, so they didn't let Pantera play. And I was, I bought Cowboys from Hell. I was a huge fan already, and that was a big disappointment. Uh, so wow. I, I missed wow. Pantera that night. They didn't wow. play. Wow. Well, to some extent, I think this will this will fill that hole in your heart when you see them as they <laughs> are now. Because you close your eyes, you close your eyes, and man, it, it feels so good. And then you open them again, and you see the guys that are making this happen, and it's just such a blessing for all of us that are, that are still Pantera fans. Can't wait. Thank you so much, Rob, for calling in. Uh, nice to talk to you again. And uh, good, good luck to see you, with my the, friend. Good luck okay. with the forthcoming album and tours and everything and i hope to see you again in the future all the best thank you so much my friend bye take bye care bye-bye bye-bye